Hello, my name is Luke the Kook, and thank you for checking out this video on WASD FM. We're now on our third movie review. Okay, well, technically our second. Danger Team shouldn't count as a movie, it never even became a series, so I guess it could technically count as like a short TV film. I'm about to review a movie that none of my go-to reviewers have done a video on. I'm doing this video as per request by one of my viewers, and thought that I could steal some jokes from, I don't know, maybe like the Critical Drinker. He never reviewed it. Then I thought, what did Jeremy John think of this movie? He never reviewed it. Then I thought, surely at least Red Letter Media covered this film. Nope. I can't plagiarize any other YouTuber, so these thoughts are my own. Of course, that's not to say that other people didn't review this, but after seeing this movie for myself, a uh, second or third time, I decided that I had enough of my own thoughts. Get in, loser. We're going to the 70s. Expect to see a lot of denim. In the 1970s, horror was at its peak. It's pinnacle. It's absolute zenith. No other decade was greater for horror films than the 1970s. Some people would argue no decade was greater for films in general. Well, they can keep arguing that one because that one is entirely subjective. Well, same with my horror movies argument, but they can look at the resume of the 1970s. You had Jaws, Halloween, The Omen, Dawn of the Dead, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Suspiria, Blackula. I couldn't resist mentioning that one. My personal favorite, The Exorcist, and The Car. The what? The car? But how can you even tell that that's a horror film? Clearly not by the title. I mean, with a movie title like The Piano, what genre do you expect that to fall in? I would hope not buddy cop comedy. Well, what clue before seeing this movie would lead us horror fans to check it out? How about the poster? Is it a phantom, a demon, or the devil himself? There's nowhere to turn, nowhere to hide, no way to stop. Oh, holy crap. That does sound terrifying. Then you just see people running away from what we assume is the titular car in the night, in the dark. But what's so scary about just a car? Michael Myers is a stalking figure that can hide behind the bushes and find you anywhere. Pazuzu pretends to be a friendly ghost to get you to open yourself up to the dark spiritual realm. Blackula is a black vampire. But the car? Surely you can just get a couple of confused drivers from South Carolina to drive side by side, impeding the speed limit like they always do, and you'll be fine. Well, no, it's not that easy. And don't call me Shirley. All right, it took me long enough to get around to doing this review. I don't even think you can find this movie on Netflix anymore as of me reviewing it. So, uh, I don't know, see if you can find it on Shutter. They're not sponsoring me, it'd just be the appropriate first streaming service to check because it's basically Netflix for horror movies. We are introduced to an attractive young couple who must be our main protagonist that we follow for the entirety of the film because they're the first ones we're introduced to. That's always how it works in horror movies, right? The couple race each other in bicycles along a road straight out of a classic 007 movie and cut between them riding and the POV of an approaching car that catches up to them and rhythmically honks its own theme song at them. Well, all they have to do is outrun the car, and they should be fine, right? Spoiler, they're not fine. In my own opinion, all this scene was missing was that the demon should have just stuck its head out the window and then shouted, LAFT! ON YOUR LAFT! <laughs> Bicyclists always think they're better than everyone, stuck up arseholes, and their interest in preserving the environment. We meet a much cuter couple that are into quickies with kids listening in on them, also apparently into Edward G. Robinson roleplay. Now you listen to me, copper. You move toward that door, she, and I move slowly toward the back door. I ain't gonna take any chances. You're hanging around with me, see? But don't look at me. I mean, I know I'm white, but even I don't understand white people half the time. Our introduction to this family is more of a Kodak moment than our introduction to Ethan Mars and Heavy Rain. Meanwhile, a drifter plays a bugle. This isn't any bugle, this is a French horn. French horn, while some old guy beats his wife. The old guy threatens to make the drifter fart music for a year, which sounds like a kink for the young man. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Farting music. For a year. <laughs> I guess you can't threaten him with a good time. So is he hitchhiking because he's trying to get to LA and make it as a big time famous French horn player? Or is it just for this expeditions? In any case, he chose a bad day for hitchhiking as he's now being introduced to not Christine. Because this is before Christine. So I guess you could say this movie was in the BC era. <laughs> Slow down, you won't even see me. That should have been a blessing for you. 
You could have just let that one go, but instead you wanted to become roadkill. Way to go, Johnny Norris. Our hero shares some exposition about marrying Lauren, the Edward G. Robinson impersonator. I think they should get married too. I really hope it works out well for that couple. Then Wade, our hero, takes his daughters to school on his motorcycle before arriving to the scene of the roadkill crime. What I'd be most concerned about from this whole situation is now a hitchhiking ghost is going to come out of this death. Hey, that could have been the spinoff sequel. The cops grill Amos, the wife-beating old man, about the rampaging car's details. You know, sensible questions. I mean, this guy called in the scene of the crime, so likely the cops will want to know what to go after. What the hell? Am I on trial here? No, they're just trying to get a physical description to know what car to look out for. I mean, you did call the cops, didn't you? I don't know. Damn it, I don't know! Amos isn't a car guy. He doesn't know it resembled a 1971 Lincoln Continental Mark III. And honestly, I didn't know either until I looked it up. Hawk from Twin Peaks, not really, threatens a racist crank caller with a kink the caller might actually be into, with some shoehorn dialogue meant to rally the audience in a unified, victorious laughter. But you, White Eyes, you're gonna be in heap big trouble, cause I'm gonna track you down and shoot an arrow straight up your ass. I guess it breaks up the high tension from the last scene. This scene seems to be used for us, the audience, to know that the police chief is telling his subordinates to look out for the bad guy. But in all seriousness, it does show an empathetic side to cops who today have a less than favorable image. I don't like it at all. About 24 minutes into the movie, we finally get reminded of the first victims of the movie. Here we thought French horn player was going to get all the attention. So the reason the writers included an additional death separate from the bicyclist in the very beginning of the film was to show the cops wanted to escalate matters to pretty much martial law. I want this entire area sealed off. No cars. Black, gray, blue, get in or out. No one getting in the town and no one getting out. I mean... What's that sound like to you? There's also a subplot involving the abused wife wanting to press charge. Oh, hey, look, a cop is drinking on the job. Uh, what was I talking about again? Thank God, some action. I mean, no, not the police chief. And after Amos shows us some acting lessons. I was crossing the street to go to the club. He came out of the dark. He looked like he was heading right at me. He swerved. I dove. He hit Everett. It was the same guy, and that's all I know. And the Oscar goes to... So far, the cops have been able to confirm one major identifying detail about the car. Big and black. Always gotta narrow it down to the poor blacks. Had your kids, had your wife. If they're all black. With Everett dead, that means it's time for Wade, the hero we've been following, to step up and concoct a brilliant strategy that will surely nab the crook. Let's hear your plan, Wade. What do we do? How the hell do I know? Ah, he's playing aloof. A wise choice to subvert the enemy. With such a vague description, the enemy could be anyone in the room, right? At least anyone big and black. But I don't see any black guys in this squad. Dagler County reports a black vehicle, two-door unidentified make. Sounded like open pipes. Oh. Not a big and black guy, but a big and black car. I see. I wonder how disappointed the cops are. Maybe they'll be less disappointed to find out that the driver of the big and black car was a big and black guy. There was no driver in the car. <laughs> That's just preposterous. Are you sure you didn't just blend in with the night? Don't do it. Don't do it. Call McDonald and, and tell her to cancel it. Well, with the parade reasonably called off, the occasion seems to call for a parade. What's the parade for again? I suppose I noticed one similarity among every person in the parade. They're all wearing jeans. It's a denim parade! Thank God for denim! There's really nothing like it. Wait, wasn't this parade supposed to be called off or something? Whatever, the car was strategically taking out one to two people at a time with limited witnesses, so, you know, it's not like anything bad is gonna happen to a large crowd in broad daylight, right? Oh, crap. It's, it's the car! Come on, people, can't you move in those jeans? Your lives are on the line! Run, Jimmy, run! <laughs> Quit faking, Jimmy. You're already getting out of the parade. Now get in that cemetery that's sure to keep you safe. Well, now what? The car can't seem to enter for some reason. Naturally, we're going to get a little bored just camping out here. What can we do for entertainment? Hey, you! Why don't you get out of your big, ugly car, huh? We'd like to see what you look like. Seems as good idea as any. Son of a bitch! Oh, crap.
The car probably prefers brunettes over blondes. One of those guys. Such toxic masculinity. Psycho idiot horses ass! See, guys only do that when they're trying to impress a hot girl. Margie wisely calls for help, and help is indeed on the way. Tadpole. What? Tadpole? Must be a 70s insult. Duh. So, who do you think is going to win this one? Driverless demon car? Or the cop that's not even the lead hero? Ray, I missed him twice! I guess that's a big hint. Metcalf. Where's Denson? Where's Magruder? Where's Barry? Denson, Magruder, Barry, Metcalf. So the car leads the cops on a chase up a dead-end road at the top of a mountain, or a hill, or a plateau, or whatever it is. Got it! He's trapping himself up there! Surely the car will get trapped, and be forced to surrender. There's no way out! No escape! No way to defend itself now! No! Well, well, well. How the turntables... Ah. Let me help you close that. The cop attempts his ultimate defense strategy by funny-facing the car, only to meet his own demise. You know, it was probably a bad idea for this guy to put his matches next to the canisters of kerosene. What I really don't get is how proud this demonic car is that it keeps honking its own theme song. Whatever happened to the good old days when villains used to just refer to themselves in the third person while claiming their victory? Ha! Safari Joe does it again! Yeah, like that! Wait, this was the 70s, so these were the good old days. Damn. Well, anyway, Demonic Car is outnumbered this time, so surely it'll get its comeuppance. <laughs> Seriously? Seriously? We just saw damage on that car, but all of a sudden it just fixed itself faster than Wolverine? Damn demon cars? Again, with honking its own theme. But our main hero is here, and he brought his gun, and plot armor, and we get our Dragon Ball Z stare down session. Did he miss? Did Wade learn how to shoot at, like, a stormtrooper school? He totally did! Pardon me, would you have any Grey Poupon? Wimp. And the car gets beamed up by Scotty. We'll meet again, demon car! After a scene straight out of Return of the King, Wade interrogates the alcoholic cop, Luke, a disgrace to my name, about why he didn't cancel the denim parade. Well, the reason is pretty simple. Luke misses one of the victims of the demon car. It, it's been so much. It's been a lot. Speaking of demon car victims... I guess that means Wade won't have to convince the kids to accept Lorne anymore as his potential new bride. I also hope they have homeowner's insurance that covers cars driving through their house. But Luke discovers a weakness to the car. I know why he didn't go into the cemetery. The ground 
was hallowed. Good job, Luke. Maybe you're not such a disgrace to my name. But seriously, quit drinking. I mean, at least on the job. So the cops that are left form together to devise a plan that will defeat the demon car once and for all. So Wade goes to the garage for the tools he needs. But the car is apparently teleported inside the garage. Don't! But the car seems to be taking a nap. And instead of Wade going through the door he closed on his neighbor, he tries to pry his way out of the car entrance. But the car won't let him, and tries to poison Wade with the fumes. Or deafen him. Which seems to work until the car blows out the windows and Wade makes his dramatic escape with his motorcycle. Hey! Don't tailgate motorcyclists! It's not safe! Guys, he's hanging in right on my tail! You better be ready! That son of a bitch is coming right behind us! I would have phrased that differently. Unless it was meant to be said like that, in which case I, I hope protection was involved. Going toward the canyon! I've got him, Luke! Get to the top of the canyon! Get to the top of I sure hope they can set up their dynamite and rope escapes on time. In all seriousness, Wade playing with the car kinda looks like a boss battle from a video game. Too bad that's a video game that never happened. I'm really at the edge of my seat during this scene. I just, I just don't think our heroes are gonna make it. They've never done anything like this before. I think, I think. Oh, never mind. Man, I can never predict how a movie will end. But now we see the car in its true form. And then it goes away. Well done, guys. But like in every horror film, is the nightmare truly over? It was until 2019 when a spin-off sequel was low-key released. But otherwise, yeah, it's pretty much over. That was The Car, a cheesy, goofy movie, especially for a horror film, but still pretty enjoyable to watch. Still more enjoyable than anything I've seen manufactured out of Hollywood in the past couple of years. Not the best horror film, not the worst horror film, but still one I recommend. The characters were human, flawed, none of them ended the story the same person that they were when they started. You get the feeling this takes place in one of those small towns where everyone knows each other, which makes it more effective, because why would this curse be happening to such a small town? The origin of the car is best left unknown, because I stand by my claim that's how horror movies should work, at least sometimes. Everyone seemed to enjoy the role that they were cast in, and I didn't get any sense that any actor didn't want to be there. I also got a good sense of the connection between Wade and Lauren. Luke struggled with his addiction, and Everett still harboring feelings for Bertha, the abused wife of Amos. I went to high school with her. She was the first. There's a lot of things happening here in this small town, which breathes life into the daily lives of everyone being tortured by this demonic car. Not something I see pulled off very well in horror movies of today. Overall, I really like this movie. That's all I have for this movie review. That was The Car, worth a watch wherever you can find it. My name is Luke the Kook, and you've been watching WASD-FM. Bye! music <laughs> for a year. <laughs>